Welcome back to the Original Gangsters podcast. Uh, we have another Zoom edition here. I'm Jimmy Bucciolato here with my intrepid colleague, Scott Bernstein. Hey, now. And we have a very special guest today, our returning champ, Douglas Sentry, who was who was on our show a few weeks ago. And we discussed I brought my, my props here. Uh, we discussed <laughs> his book on the Russian mafia, the last boss of Brighton. And it was a popular episode. So we're we're happy to have him back. And um, we uh, are going to discuss uh, his other book, Hunting El Chapo. And uh, the reason why we want on is people who are following current events, I'm sure, are aware of the strife going on in Mexico. El Chapo's son was arrested recently, and the cartel is pushing back, and things are getting quite violent there. So we have a lot to talk about tonight with the cartels. Doug, thank you. Welcome, and uh, we appreciate your time. I am delighted to be back. I listened to your last episode about the Gambinos and the Sicilians, and I'm a fan of the show now, so it's a pleasure to be here. But yeah, I got called from all kinds of Canadian media, U.S. media, uh, just because I'd written about Chapo, and these, this is his son. And it does tie in, of course, to his drug trafficking organization, and Sinaloa being the ground zero for all narco trafficking in Mexico. So newsworthy, but after doing The Last Boss, you know, I mean, it's like people ask me, what what crazy motherfucking like gangsters do you not write about? Like every dangerous group, <laughs> you seem to have an in with them. I'm like, okay. Well. It, it, can I just throw something out before we get started? And then we yeah. can talk about the book and then jump ahead to what's going on now. But just to give people a, a little bit of a, a palate pleaser or, or a teaser for what we got. It, it's it's not just like Jimmy said strife. I'm not trying to correct him or 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 tell or, or say it's a mischaracterization but it's all out chaos right now from what i've uh, read that, that you might have two dozen bodies that have dropped in the last week uh, it's it's a uh, it's a war they, zone they arrested and video uh, uh guzma it's a narco terrorism crisis more than narco trafficking they are basically terrorizing the state of Sinaloa. And this, we can go through the history. This goes back to what happened in 2019 when they essentially shot it out with the military and recaptured him and got him released. That didn't happen this time because of uh, the way they got him out of the state by uh, by plane. But yeah, this is not routine narco violence. This is the state, uh, the military, the police gunning it with a bunch of young narcos, the younger generation, which are called narco juniors. And uh, yeah, people down there are saying it's a war zone. It's the closest thing to a war zone. So They're we're talking about- They're shutting down airports. They're shutting down airports. Black Hawk helicopters, you know, I mean, and the and the guys have, the cartel government have 50 cal machine guns. It's It says who has more firepower and who has more juice within that state. And the, you know- uh, we'll, we'll go through it logically so that we're not jumping all over the map. But yes, this is not, oh, a few tourists got mo murdered in Cancun, or this is a essentially the capital and the main city of Sinaloa, Culiacan. All uh, traffic was shut down by burning buses. All the three airports, which is Los Mochis, which is a smaller one, Mazatlan, a very popular tourist destination, and Culiacan, all international airports shut down. And I have a lot of Canadian friends it's very close to the west coast of Canada to get down to Maslan. People were just stuck in their hotels. I mean, people were asking me, are you safe down there as a tourist? I said, yeah, stay in your hotel and drink your Coronas and your tequila and don't venture out. And I would see these stories in the Canadian media that said, tourists are still you know, caught in this. And their big complaint was, you can't believe how long the line is at the restaurant in the hotel. <laughs> I was like, meanwhile, there's dead bodies. I mean, just chill in your hotel and this will pass and the tourism will get back to normal eventually, because organized crime in Mexico does not like to disrupt the tourism. I mean, that's just not in their interest. So, because they, they they generally extort the hotels, extort, they have a piece of everything. It's just, it's not just narco trafficking, it's mafia. So they want the tourism stuff to go on, uh, you know, un, unencumbered by 50 caliber machine guns shooting up airplanes. Yeah, that's um, something that when people have asked me about if I go to travel to Sicily, should I be worried about the mafia? And I'm like, no, absolutely not. The mafia is invisible. If you go to Sicily, who do you think owns the the, the restaurants and hotels in those coastal towns and and, and villages? Like, actually, yeah. those are some of the safest safest places to be for a tourist. Is is a mafia town in Sicily? Of Believe course. me, no one fucks around 
<laughs> with ter- with tourists. Uh, now Palermo, you know, there's parts of Palermo that get kind of rough because you have it's more urban, you have poverty and things like that. But in the coastal towns, uh, the mafia is invisible, and they're, those those towns are very safe precisely because they're making money off of the uh, you know the commerce and the tourism. So I, I think there's parallels with places like Mexico. Yeah, I saw Stanley Tucci, fantastic show about traveling Italy. And when he went to Sicily, he went to a kind of mafia owned restaurant, but it's completely safe. It was just a question of extortion and who gets paid off. And it, uh, when I talk about, well, what's going on now, uh, just for Americans, so they don't think all Mexico is, Mexico is a vast country with many different states. This, you know, the capital, Ciudad de Mexico, Mexico City is like 25 million people. It's, it's the population of Canada in one city. Sinaloa is the gangster state. So I liken it to when Al Capone had Chicago, everybody knew he kind of controlled who was the mayor. The cops didn't, you know, they they made bootlegging busts when Capone threw them a bone. But the city was run by a machine. And at the top of that machine was organized crime. That's what's going on in Sinaloa. You know, El Chapo had it, and it's largely through bribery. But that's kind of a rogue state. And that's part of the reason the violence exploded is once you extradite a guy from there to Mexico City, now you're not in the same, now you're not dealing with the same corrupted officials, the same police that are on the take, et cetera. So yeah, it's Capone's Chicago in the 20s, but it's just a state in Mexico, which happens to be the the heart of all the drug trafficking in that country. Well, let's, just, let's, uh, yeah, go ahead. I was going to, uh, yeah, go ahead, Scott. Let me just add one more thing and then I'll throw it back to you, Jimmy, and we can kind of start from the beginning. What correlation do you see, Doug, uh, between uh, President Biden's visit uh, to Mexico City and the fact that uh, Ovidio, uh, El Chapo's son, was was taken off the streets within days or hours of each other. Uh, was that uh, was that just a coincidence, uh, they, or was it? They, I think they got him on the seventh, and Biden's there now on the ninth and tenth, the eleventh with Trudeau. Yeah. So it's the North America. Just you know, don't leave out our Canadian Prime Minister. By the way, the three amigos are. Yeah. Um, you know what I saw, being a journalist and Scott, you're a journalist. Is that, you know, okay, Ovidio's involved in cocaine, methamphetamine, but a lot of the headlines in the American paper said fentanyl, 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 fentanyl. Yeah. Now, he's a producer of fentanyl. He's the, like, what the is fentanyl it? capo, de capo. De, well, de capo. He's, he's, he's the poster boy for it right. in the media. So what is the crisis that we're talking about most in Canadian cities, American cities, overdoses of this? Oh, my God, people, even Prince and Tom Petty, they went for you know, what they thought was pain medication and they get this stuff, this fentanyl that's a hundred times stronger than they want in the OD. So it looks like, wow, you got a fentanyl producer. He's 32 years old. He's got labs. But by the way, yes, they get the precursor, precursor drugs in from China and they have super labs down there. And it's very easy to get it across the border. So you get a fentanyl producer. That's a nice headline. And then right before Biden's visit. So everything in Mexico is political. You know, they turned El Chapo over for extradition on the day they flew him in the day that Trump took office, you remember. Um, the timing of the uh, the summit of the three leaders of North America, it's, let's just call it fortuitous. I don't know. I can't make the correlation. But he had shot it out with the cops in 2019. Probably someone from Biden's, you know, the chief of staff said, hey, what do you have going on in that state there? Is it under control again? And I'm sure they had a beat on this guy. I mean, they knew where he was. It's just, can you get him? Get him, extradite him to Mexico City. He's in Altiplano prison there. So you can, I don't know what they've said in the press conference. I haven't heard it, but I'm sure if they've addressed the drug trafficking problem, well, we've just made a major arrest. So it's it's really good media PR. And the top narcos in Mexico are the politicians. Everybody kind of knows this. It's a, I mean, they are the top of the food chain. So nobody gets arrested without somebody up top, like pushing the button and saying, yeah, he he can go. So I can't make the correlation because I don't know it, but I can say it's a very interesting timing because it's a perfect photo op to say we have announced, and this isn't just like Coke. Oh, that's the fentanyl that you keep hearing about in the States. It's it's a very good um, media message for this supposed war on drugs, which we've been losing and the addiction crisis of America and Canada is really what we're talking about and who supplies it. So, um, yeah, I think it's it's time to that event, certainly. I mean, if it wasn't, it's just a very, very, very odd coincidence. Um, so let's talk about uh, hunting El Chapo and then we'll swing back to this, what's going on now, because I think this is a, this is a, a good read if you want to contextualize what's happening now. This is, this is a good... Um, 
preface or however you want to think of it at, to really um, understand the, the politics of what's going on now. So tell us a little bit about hunting El Chapo and then we'll, we'll, you know, jump back into the current stuff. Well, the book came to me with the agent Drew Hogan at the time of Chop. He he masterminded, I would say, it was a massive operation to capture him. But on the American side, there was a DEA agent named Andrew Hogan. Just he wasn't high up, he was a special agent, but he was he had the Sinaloa cartel desk at the embassy in Mexico City. Uh he partnered with Homeland Security, they were out of Texas. Uh, so it was a joint investigation of all kinds, uh, HSI, Homeland Security Investigations, DEA, which does the drug trafficking. But of course, they they had FBI guys. There were so many cases. Uh, he came to me, he came to an agent. Actually, this was going to be one of my own books written about him. And because he was leery of Chapo's power, you know, I mean, this is a guy, he literally had Chapo in his arms, like in that hotel in Mazatlan and he said what's up Chapo <laughs> he was carrying they raided Chapo's uh, safe house and he had one of Chapo loved these like nondescript black hats and Drew just grabbed so he's wearing one of Chapo's hat he's carrying Chapo's Colt Super 38 pistol which is monogram he literally it's on the back of the book and I said so you kind of became the bad guy right uh and then it changed the publisher kind of got involved and said he's about six four blonde blue eyed looks a bit like Bradley Cooper and they said can't he be the, like, this is how books work. Can't he be on TV? And we got a Dateline segment. We did all that stuff. I don't know that that's a smart thing. So I, then I changed all the pronouns and it became instead of he, 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 I, I. <laughs> but yeah, we collaborated on it. And uh, at first he, when I, we sat down, he showed me the, the hierarchical charts of Sinaloa cartel. And I said, Drew, I'm never going to master this. He said, you don't have to know all this stuff. You just have to know what I know. So I became an expert on his investigation and what drew did was really a very remarkable dogged pursuit that went on for five or seven years he started off actually with a ta task force in san diego and they were on the kind of underlings and the money laundering and getting up that ladder until the point where they broke the the blackberry messaging devices they figured out this very intricate system it's a, a lot of it's very high tech because it involved uh chapel was never stupid enough to direct message they would they called it mirroring. They would message via BlackBerry to an office and some lowly schlub guy would just retype the message in another device. So they could never really get the device that was in Chapo's hands. But they got a beat on him and they trusted, the only group that they really could trust to do the raid is called Semar, which is the secretary of the Marina, the Mexican Marines. They are considered incorruptible. So they had to go to this admiral in Mexico City and then they launched the the mission. The, this is the famous mission where he escaped through a bathtub. If you saw that, it's in the book, like a hydraulic. He had five to seven interconnected houses. And I call it like a gerbil, like a habit trail or something. Like he didn't have to leave. He he would go down his little tunnels, and he had one with a bath uh, with a beautiful um, swimming pool, la piscina. But it was covered because he knew there were drone surveillance. He knew he was being watched, and he was very careful. So it's a really remarkable gumshoe detective story but told with all the high tech stuff that you can imagine goes into modern day gumshoe detective and you know in my mind it's like you have to really inhabit the mind of the bad guy to catch the bad guy so he knows everything he knew everything about chapel's personal life his his womanizing the the virgins he demanded like it was just it's crazy stuff what what's in the book so i don't want to give all the spoilers but drew did a really remarkable thing if anybody's watched narcos mexico a very brave d agent named kiki camarena and ricky camarena was murdered on the orders of you know a rafael cairo Quintero, several guys but it was basically the guadalajara cartel at that time he was getting too close they killed him so there in the mexican uh sorry in the u.s embassy in mexico city they have a big bust of him and they call it the kiki room and, you know, everybody knows the spooks are on the top floor. So it's like in, in an embassy, you've got the CIA, DEA, uh, Drew called a meeting. And at any given time, I think there were 20 different El Chapo cases going on in Chicago. I mean, you know, in New York, FBI. And he called all law enforcement. He said, look, let's get put our egos aside. Let's sh because you guys know this better than almost anybody else. A lot of our law enforcement people don't cooperate with each other because it's <laughs> my case. It's my case. And he said, let's, you know, fuck the, fuck the, can I curse on the show? I can't remember. Okay. Of course. Uh, <laughs> Please you know, do. Fuck the, e fuck the ego, fuck the, the uh, attorney general who's going to announce this. It all was uh, overseen by 
a holder actually. So Drew has this big meeting where he has a PowerPoint. He goes, here's what we know. Here's what some FBI guys came, some other guys. And they, they said, let's all cooperate, put all our stuff on the table because this guy was the most wanted man in the world since he broke out of his first prison escape, you know, the Punta Grande. I think for 15 years, he was on the run and they knew where he was. They had nailed it down to a series of safe houses. Then it was just a question of, can we go get him? And they were worried about what's currently happening. They were worried about a massive gunfight and only by stealth. I mean, they caught Chapo running down the, you know, he went, he escaped through the bathtub and then fled through the sewer in his tidy whitey. <laughs> he had these little go bags <laughs> in every one of his tunnels. He had um, like, I think it was like packets of Cialis, little jockey shorts. And because he was always naked, he was always when he wasn't running the drug trafficking, he was fucking some girl in in, in various safe houses. <laughs> and and I remember, and what there's a funny line in the book. They said, "Damn, how many times do you have to slither out of your bathtub and like through the sewers that you need a go bag with your tiny whiteies and your like?" He had the same little like um, the one thing he didn't have was a gun. So he calls. Uh, they started to zero in on, on him in Mazatlan because he didn't have his his pistol. And so he started to say, I need my, my Colt. I need a Beretta. And then, you know, they did a raid there and they caught him in that hotel or that resort in Mazatlan. Um, so that was the real capture. And then of course he tunneled out of Altiplano and then he met with T K T Castillo and Sean Penn. And then basically okay. they recaptured him following the exact same blueprints because they broken his BlackBerry messaging system. And I mean, he was a savvy guy. He is a savvy guy. For example, he used BlackBerry. Who the hell uses BlackBerry? Everybody's on iPhones, right? He used BlackBerry because he knew that BlackBerry was a Canadian company and he knew it'd be harder to get warrants for the wiretaps that you need. He kind of understood a lot of stuff, partly because he employed very, very, very technical people. All those tunnels, like he invented the, the narco tunnel, right? The first tunnel in Douglas, Arizona. I mean, he, he would bring in engineers and architects from Switzerland. I mean, he would pay millions to make these tunnels because he realized... It's a great way to get the drugs across the border. If I put 10 million into the tunnel, I'm going to make 100 million. And it's a lot safer than losing the loads. So I'm very, I was very impressed for a guy that only went to school till he was about eight years old and is really illiterate. You, you can read his Blackberry messages in the book. Like he can't spell the word kitchen in Spanish. Um, cocina, C O C I N A. He spells it K O S Y N A. And I said, is this internet slang? They said, no, Chapo just can't spell. So they knew when he had a device in his physical hands because they were like, it's like, a, I'm giving away some of the book, but it's like, it's like a tell. It's like those little things that detect. It's like, no, that's not Condor, his pilot typing. it. That's Chapo because only he uses, he really, but having said that, he was a very savvy guy. He understood, like he was trying to expand to Australia. He understood things about marketing and price points and distribution. I mean, and, and he was in the weeds every day of his drug trafficking with his sons. That's where we get into what's going on in the news. He had four trusted sons that while he was in that safe house, lockdown, essentially, he couldn't go anywhere. Uh, he would he relied on his four key sons. He has many kids, but four of them to do the day to day, make sure certain people got bribed, make sure certain shipments got off. So, I mean, he would delegate his drug trafficking organization essentially to Los Chapitos, the Little Chapos, which are four, four of his key sons, one of whom is Ovidio. He was living a very miserable life. He was pasty white when they caught him because he couldn't even get the sum. Like, I just thought, this is a guy like, a, he, he didn't have that heyday like Escobar did of like having a zoo. And I mean, by the time he was the wealthiest man, you know, once Forbes or whoever put him on one of the wealthiest men in the world, right? Billionaire drug lord. Every U.S. agency is looking for him, right? So he didn't have that heyday to flaunt his wealth. In fact, uh, he drove around when he did leave his safe houses in a Jetta, a Volkswagen Jetta, level four body armor. So the thing was heavy as fuck because he had to have, it had to have been like a souped up engine, but it looked like a Jetta. You know, it, it would withstand gunfire and all that. And he would berate his sons like, what's with the Bugattis and what's with the McLarens? Because they, <laughs> they would get these million dollar sports cars some of it was for money laundering, but they were just flossing around Kuliakan, untouchables, you know, blasting off their guns in nightclubs. No, he was very, very low key. And that's how the old school narcos of that first generation did it. They they knew, you know, you guys know this, you know, the plateau of plumo. Do you want the silver or do you want the lead? Chapo always went with silver. 
You never heard about him having shootouts with the police because he bribed everybody up to the president of Mexico. It came out of trial. The, pre, the, the former president of Mexico may have accepted up to $100 million, up to $100 million. I don't think that that came up at trial in 2019, but it wasn't admissible as proof. But he understood that the, the further up you bribed everybody, the safer you were. And some of the his most vehement rivals were the Los Cetas which were the former special forces. And a lot of those narco banners that were a rage for a while would say, you know, Mexican government, stop protecting Chapo. Because everybody kind of knew he paid them all off. And these younger guys, his sons, they don't have that savvy. Either they don't have the political connections or they don't understand. It's a lot uh, wiser to bribe the generals to than to shoot it out with the troops because that's not going to end well. So Chapo was a very savvy guy. I don't think we'll ever see a drug lord of his stature again. Um, it's just there's too much heat on these guys right now. And that first generation of Mexicans, you know, there was the Padrino, which was Miguel Angel Felix Gallardo. I don't, I'm not a fan of Narcos Mexico in terms of accuracy of everything, but they do get the players right. You know, Caro Quintero, that generation, they were, they were either corrupted cops like Miguel Angel Felix uh, Gardo was a judicial police, or they were these campesinos. They were farmers like Cairo Quintero, who grew the Sensimilia. And Chapo was just a, like, a, he would always say, I'm just a farmer. <laughs> yeah, he's a farmer of poppies <laughs> and other, <laughs> other illicit substances. But yeah, uh, the book, I think it's just the word El Chapo. I mean, I don't know. I think this is not German. This is Dutch. Uh, this is in Spanish, uh, El Cazando El Chapo. In French, El, Cha El Chapo La, La Trac. It has 17 different international editions. It's the only book I've ever done that got translated into so many languages. And I wasn't really sure why, except that there seems to be this fascination worldwide with the idea of narcos. It's a, a cottage false... industry. Yeah. Writing, writing, chronicling, discussing El Chapo uh, is, an, <laughs> is an industry within itself. But my friends who are really Mexican journalists covering stuff, they don't even use, they, they say, I don't like that narrative of, of cartel, which came about like, you know, well, the war on drugs with Nixon. But when Reagan started to go after the Colombians, what I look at, these groups in Mexico are organized crime. They engage in extortion. Uh, in all of the tourist towns, there is an organized crime group. Now the power is uh, the new generation of Jalisco, Nueva Generación de Jalisco and a guy named Mencho. He's, they're more powerful than Sinaloa. They're out of Guadalajara. And all the all these resorts, up to the little guy pretending to be Mickey Mouse and signing autographs, they all have to pay off somebody. Somebody's getting paid to keep. So they engage in extortion. They engage in hit, uh, murder for hire. So when I say, well, why are they a cartel and a guy like Boris is a mafioso? They're doing the same thing. Boris, <laughs> Boris Nafield was the heroin importer and a cocaine importer. They engage in all aspects of crime. And I actually think they are, I would rather call them narco-terrorists in, in terms of what's going on because the, the average person who lives in Sinaloa who wants to go to work at that hotel to change the sheets or be the waitress or work at the gas station, I mean, they're being terrorized by these thugs who just basically are, you know, it was a lot smoother when Chapo was in charge, right? And just as with Escobar, they are beloved in some of these poor regions because they do provide more infrastructure than the corrupted government. You know, uh, Escobar built the Medellin soccer team, right? Well, El Chapo had schools and, and recreational things. That the government's not buying that in these little towns. Like he's from La Tuna in the mountains. So the people aren't going to turn him in. And one of the reasons it was so hard for Drew and his Homeland Security partner to engage in this uh, stealth, they went in with Black Hawk hel helicopters. They landed in the middle of the night is that everywhere in the city of Culiacan, there are what are called halcones, hawks, means lookouts. Everywhere there's lookouts. And the minute they would move, like Chapo, they would see in his Chapo's messages, uh, the, the rapidos, uh, the rapid ones, that's what they call the Marines. The rapidos are moving again. They're, they're flying out of uh, Baja, California. So they had to stage it. They had to look like there was military training exercises so that Chapo wouldn't panic. And then they did a false flag. They, they made it look like they were going after Caro Quintero. But everything they were doing, he knew at first. So, I mean, it's actually scary how high up it goes in Mexico. Like, you know, when he tunneled out of Altiplano, 
it's not that, I mean, it was, it was ingenious that they did a 1.5 kilometer tunnel with like a Steve McQueen super motorcycle, but a lot of people were paid not to hear the jackhammers, right? Let's not be, this was not just like the great escape in World War II where the guys were ingenious. A lot of prison officials got a lot of money to not hear what was going on. And that's the way he operated. He was a very smart guy that way. He knew who to bribe and how much it would take to keep his, he just wanted the money to keep flowing. That's it. Is he, is he a folk hero? Do the, do the <clears throat> citizens of, of Mexico look at him? Oh, yeah. Uh, in a positive light, more than a negative light, especially after the uh, the escapes. I mean, I've talked to Mexicans I've met in New York, and they'd be like, "Do you really think the Americans have him?" I think it's a double, a body <laughs> double. Um, and so he was he was ranked uh, number um, seven hundred one on uh, the Forbes list, seven hundred seven hundred first richest man in the world. All over Mexico, you find these baseball hats that say 701. It's kind of a code. Or you'll see people hashtag Puro 701, pure Culiacan. Like, and you're like, what the hell is 701? Oh, it's his Forbes ranking. So, yes, it's a very captivating mythology that a poor, there's a very famous narco corrido called uh, El Nino de la Tuna. It's the beginning of the book. It's called El Nino de la Tuna. The little boy from this town of La Tuna. And at the age of eight, he was out of school. He was selling oranges on the side of the road to help the, the family survive. So to go from a, a barefoot kid selling oranges on the side of the road to Forbes magazine, 700, that's an, that's an intoxicating mythology in a very poor country. Well, this poor man, he just did it, and he sold it to the gringos. See, they don't think Mexicans are consuming the drugs. They think, look, these 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 corrupt, or what do they want to say? These degenerate Americans, they want to party with the cocaine. They want the methamphetamine. Now, there is a bit of a drug problem in Mexico, but most of the consumption is abroad, right? So, yeah, I mean, I, I think he's a, he's a sick motherfucker. Like, he was having sex with virgins, like prostitutes. He would specify that this madam in Culiacan sent him virgins. So they were like 14, 15. And we couldn't really say that in the book because it came out at trial after the book, but we had to say they all, they look awfully young, even though we knew they were 14. I said, this is a degenerate motherfucker. Like he's not a good guy, but yes, just the way Capone or see, I like it a bit to John Dillinger. Dillinger's legend was partly because he escaped several times. Right. And I think people like that. They love the idea. He, he did a bit of the Robin Hood stuff. But the fact that he was captured, broke out of one prison, and that second prison escape, I mean, that really made him. I mean, not just in Mexico, in hip hop. The amount of freaking lyrics I hear that talk about El Chapo and I'm, I'm motorcycling out of the cell. And I'm like, <laughs> dude, he wasn't living a glamorous life. If you read this book and you think his life was fun, I mean, he was in the weeds of his organization. And one thing people need to understand, the days of the, the multi-ton shipments that like, they used to do back in the days of letterer and multi-ton shipments and narco subs and all that bullshit. That's gone. What they do, because Sinaloa is on the coast, uh, it's it's way more effective and, and less risky than shipping several tons of cocaine to ship 350 kilos, 500 kilos. And all they do uh, is have it being dragged behind a little fishing boat. And if the Coast Guard were to come out to them, they can cut bait. And then they have a GPS on a boy. It's it's weighted. And then they circle in their little cessnas and find it. And I mean, that's a, that's an ingenious thing, too, because like, if you lose 350 kilos, it's not as bad as losing several tons. But I was astounded at like reading the line sheets. I read all of them. It was like he, uh, one 350 kilo uh, shipment went missing. And Chapa was just hounding his guys. Where is it? That's a drop in the bucket of the tons and tons of cocaine that he was shipping. He kept saying, where is it? Have you found it yet? How you? He wanted to know every detail. How much money was coming out of Toronto each night? How much? He just loved it. He loved living in the weeds. But aside from that, all he was doing was having sex with random women, especially prostitutes, never leaving, never having a kind of enjoyable life. So he didn't have that, I don't know, glamorous... I'm driving around in a Lambo and like, I think, I think people saw too much Escobar and Scarface thinking you could be a drug Lord and really live it up. He couldn't enjoy all that wealth, but I mean, it was an obs Escobar was, you know, in the late seventies into the early eighties was doing the tourist thing. I mean, there was all these pictures of him at Disney world and in yep. front of the white house with his family. Like it just shows you how 
off the radar he was at that time. I mean, he was still on the radar, but. But you relatively- cannot be. This is the point I make about why he lived that way. Why would he drive around in a Jetta or like just to say, like, a, you know, what if it was a Honda with with you can't be a high profile gangster. It doesn't work. I think we talked about it the last time. Maybe Carlo Gambino is the one. I can think of one or two end, uh, where a guy lived a kind of modest life and he died in his own bed. But once you're on the radar, John Gotti, I fixed these juries. They're going to come after you. Ovidio uh, Guzman Lopez, I shot it out. They're going to come after you. There is no, I can't think of an example of a high profile gangster who's on the cover of magazines, a Forbes list, because now you're you're a feather in the cap of any U.S. law enforcement that want, wants to come after you and say, I caught that guy with the $5 million reward on his head. So, I mean, it's always best to live in the shadows. I See, if I mention El Mencho, Mencho is the guy that's running the, the new generation of Jalisco. He's in his 40s. Most Americans have never heard of him. He's the power in Mexico now. I think there's only one or two photos of him. So if you're really going to be a freaking narco gangster, hide. <laughs> Stay in those mountains, stay on the run. Like it's, it's, it's really silly to be a folk hero. I mean, once you become that folk hero, but yeah, getting back to your original question, Scott, I have met so many Mexicans or or just Latin people say, I don't think they really got the job. What do you mean? Do the DNA. I think some guy is doing the time for him in Florence. He's still free in the mountains. <laughs> like, I think they got, that. sorry. I don't believe in that many fairy tales. And we just did a, an episode a few weeks ago on Detroit drug lords, and we we talked with a high profile criminal defense attorney, and and he and Scott were talking about uh, BMF a lot, uh, black mafia family, and I think the parallel in that episode is Big Meech. I mean, yep. similar thing like folk hero in certain communities in the United States, but so conspicuous, so flashy, so in your face. Yep. So guess what? The DEA, DEA, IRS, FBI, they had a hard on for him, and they and they got him. <laughs> Yeah. And, and I, t- I tell this story all the time when discussing Black Mafia Family and Big Meech. He, the guy has a fifth and a fifteen-year run, which is pretty crazy. And for the first twelve years of that run, nobody knew who he was. I mean, even exactly. it, to some degree within the government. I mean, there were a couple people that knew, but. He was not a priority. He was the biggest drug kingpin in America, and he was not a priority. He starts putting up billboards. You know, at some point, he said to himself, what's the point of being the biggest drug dealer in America if nobody knows who I am? I know. And, and that's he made the decision to let people know who he was. And at that point, his days are numbered. And, you know, within two well, years, he's locked up for 30 years. Well, well, the best example, I mean, I think the Genovese crime family in New York is considered the Ivy League of, yeah. and they call they actually call them the West Side. I think we talked about it last yeah. time. But yeah, Chin Giganti was the power. Everybody knew he was the power, but he puts t- Fat Tony Salerno as the front boss and walks around in his bathrobe. And Gotti was quoted, you know, one of the wiretaps saying, why would you want to live like Chin? Like he's walking around on Chin. <laughs> I mean, because it's a great strategy. He was still living his life and he had the power, but... That is the way it is now. You either have to lay low. I don't think there are. Now, that can help us transition to who these younger guys are. The youngsters don't understand that shit. They are on social media. They want to floss their cars. They want to be out there balling and showing the girls how much money they have. And they're not going to have that reign that um, El Mayo Zambada. So so the, the Sinaloa cartel which I can get whether that even exists. There are multiple drug trafficking organizations. The DEA likes to talk about DTOs. They're all kind of independent. So Chapo's sons have theirs, Miles and Bada. They don't, they're not hierarchical and work together, but they don't undercut, their, uh, undercut the price. That's why it's a cartel. And they use the same smuggling routes. So it's kind of like, and they're kind of allied by family and a lot of them are married to but it's not like a, it's not like a crime family that all. So Mayo Zambada is the co-equal to El Chapo, and he's I think he's had one photo of him. Gave one interview once to Proceso, a kind of narco magazine. But he's he's not he's kind of on the outs with Chapo's sons. I think they're kind of an ego power struggle. But that's the way you do it. You hide in the mountains and nobody sees you. And if and in those mountains of Mexico, you could live your life out. He could have Chapo could have lived his life out. And and ne- died in his own bed, happy, but.
but he had to be, he was a narcissist. He had to have a movie made of his life. He, I mean, he was trying to get a movie made of his life way before the Sean Penn thing. It's in the book. Like he was shopping a script because he was pissed off that people were telling his stories and he wanted to profit from it. And <laughs> then, you know, the, I don't know if you know, Keita Castillo, who she comes from a very well-known acting family in Mexico City, her father, Eric de Castillo. So she sent out a tweet that was like, oh, Chapo, if you only used your money and power for good to help the people of Mexico. And this guy who's illiterate, who's from the working class, he's looking at this high class broad and he, sorry, woman, can't talk that way, uh, and says, she likes me. So the reason he rendezvoused with her and Sean Penn was he just wanted to bang her. He thought a woman like, <laughs> like that's what all the DA, they all know that meeting because he was even like, who is this this scraggly guy that came with her? He had no <laughs> idea who Sean Penn was. But the fact, and that's the kind of class thing you have to understand about Mexico. She's educated. She spoke. She comes from a very high class or, you know, and he's not. And he, and the fact that she sent out a tweet. So then they started this flirtatious correspondence. And I was like, dude, you don't meet with actresses when you're a narco kingpin. Like, this is not. And then Sean Penn comes down there and what, like, basically writes a very bad gonzo journalistic kind of, which Chapo had no idea he was doing. He's down there kind of going, then I meet Chapo and I take a piss and I fart. And like, I read that article going, this is the most embarrassing thing. And if you really went with Chapo, he was like, who was this guy that she brought? Like, why did he have to be there? <laughs> But yeah, he wanted to get in her pants. Essentially, he wanted to get into her pants because he was ba he was banging off. I mean, he's got multiple women, multiple wives. Uh, he doesn't have a shortage of women, but they're not of a certain class in society. And she made that kind of overture by sending out a tweet in, I think, 2012 or something saying, oh, Chapo, if you used your power to help the poor of Mexico, think of what you could do. And it hit his ego and his narcissism and... I mean, it's always the downfall of these guys, right? The fact that John Gotti had his Time magazine framed in the Ravenite Social Club. It's like, dude, that's not a good look. Like, <laughs> you shouldn't be on the cover of magazines. But that's what he wanted. He wanted that validation of his, you know, I made it. So, I don't know. Are we off topic now? I'm always No, no, topic. no. It's, no, it's good. <laughs> I, I, wanted, I wanted you to talk about the book. And um, there's, there's great stuff in there. And I, I agree. Um, it, it, it's, it, you, it's clear in your book that if he would have stayed in the mountains, um, he was basically untouchable. But as you point out, he wanted the action. He couldn't resist. It was too boring up there. Yeah. Like, like he's just got a handful of his henchmen and it's and it's boring and there's nothing going on up there. And and he he, he couldn't take it. He would get bored. And so he wanted to go into the town. And um, and the and the feds that were tracking him knew that. You know, it was only a matter of time before he would venture back into the town because there's action, shopping, restaurants, women. And um, but if yeah, if he would have uh, stayed in the mountains, he might still be. I mean, may maybe they would have figured out a way to get him eventually. But, uh, you know, when you talk about the region that he was from and hiding out, it's not very accessible for like the average yep. person to, to like, like, especially like an investigative uh, team like as, like as you know, they, they would stand out first of all with with the informants but it's also just the terrain be difficult to, to access so we yeah I, I really liked when I was writing this book I was looking at like the tre treasure of the Sierra Madre one of my favorite movies and you go into this wild country of you know badges we don't need no stinking badges right and actually when the agent who conceived this book he said it's like high noon I mean, what do you mean it's like you know Gary Cooper he's like Everybody's afraid to take on, but one guy, like just focus on this one guy. Don't try to make it about a massive investigation. And that's kind of a cool story. A, a guy who is willing to take that risk because, you know, Drew married a Mexican American woman and has, and had three sons and they were living in, in Mexico city and they were at risk. So he had his kids at risk and it took a lot of, it took a toll. Anytime you're investigating in a foreign country where they have all that power, but yeah, in Sinaloa, it's just the geography too. Remember, before there was pot everywhere and cannabis stores, Mexican, what, what was it called? It wasn't Maui. Gold. There, the Acap uh, Cancun. Acapulco. Gold. Acapulco. Acapulco. Acapulco gold. Yeah, so that was grown up there in Sinaloa. It's perfect pot growing. And that's, I think they showed that in Arcos, Mexico, uh, that I don't know, it really isn't true that Carol Quintero invented the sensimilia. Like, I won't, we won't have seeds in this. 
but they had very good pot. It's a very, it's a pot growing region and they were smuggling that pot to the U.S. And then they started to just, once the, it's a very simple story. Once the U.S. cracked down on the Miami, you know, Bahamas route, they started to be the the middlemen for the the cartels out of Cali and and Medellin, and then Miguel Arthur Felix Cairo and of several others came up with this idea: stop paying us cash, pay us in product, which was smart. They started to get volumes of cocaine, which they then had the armies of Mexican American street gangs in L.A. and Phoenix, and pretty soon the Colombians were like, "Fine, just ship it." So. And but they already had those roots from the marijuana. The reason Chapo invented the narco tunnel in 1990, you don't need to go that far underground for cocaine because cocaine has no smell. But if you're having bales and bales of very strong weed, it smells. Dogs will find it. So he made a tunnel. You know, it's really cool, James Bond kind of shit. Under a pool table, press a button, pool table goes up. And I think it was uh it was it was fairly close to the Arizona border, but he came up in Douglas. So I said he invented the narco tunnel in 1989, 1990, because it's hard to get weed across the border in a tractor trailer because dogs smell it. It's a really good thing to take it underground. And so he's got that distinction. And he created the, and then by the way, when Drew, I asked Drew, when, when he escaped from Altiplano, and I said, were you surprised? He goes, it just fit his blueprint. The tunnel was exactly like all his other narco tunnels. And he's got some massive ones under San Diego. To, like what's what's amazing is once they realized you just had to have an entry point somewhere in Mexico, there's there's industrial regions of San Diego, just industrial parks, where it just it just comes up in a factory. And unless some informant snitches, they'll never find it. So they just changed the product from marijuana to cocaine and methamphetamine and everything else. And I mean, one thing they did that the Colombians didn't is they just diversified it to every drug. They said, okay, if the Americans want methamphetamine, we can make it. If they want fentanyl, we can make it. I mean, cocaine was their big money thing, but yeah, it started off that region was the pot growing region and it's and it is the high mountains, the the Sierra Madre. It really is treasure of the Sierra Madre. Humphrey Bogart, go watch that movie. And Ovid the, and Ovidia, the, <laughs> just, yeah, that's a classic. Yeah, I have the Blu-ray. That's a classic. Just to set the Remember stage. What? Sorry. Remember when the, when the corrupt the corrupt cops come up to him and said, "We're federales, give us the gold." And he says, "If you're federales, show us your badges. Badges. We yeah. don't have no stake of it." Iconic, <laughs> but, an iconic a, right. right. But that, that's exactly where he lived in the Sierra Madre mountain range. It's very inaccessible. It's even in, and if you're going to launch a helicopter raid, good luck. I mean, yeah. you got to get close. They'll flee. I mean, they they knew that drones were watching them. Like, I mean, that's the thing. We had to be careful what we said in the book. I there were there was the top level of homeland security, so drones and but I mean that wasn't cleared yet. So I remember Drew, uh, Drew saying to me, "Can you call it high altitude surveillance?" I said, "What's the difference?" <laughs> well, that could be a satellite, something else. But I mean, he knew stuff. They knew they were being watched, but it's still really hard to get in there fast because they can just flee mountain roads. You know, it's like. Backcountry, backcountry of uh, Rocky Mountains or anywhere. It's it's tough terrain. But you and know, it's also sorry, sorry. Doug, go ahead. I keep interrupting uh, you. I apologize. I, I, no, I keep talking too much. Yeah, uh, it's oh, you're the guest. It, it's also time. that the the people of those towns, Latuna, where he's from, they'll never give him up. He he provides a lot for them. So um yeah, he could have lived it all out, but I'm sure if he's thinking about it now, he probably would have said I fucked up. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. People ask me, what's he doing? I said, he's doing 400 years, multiple life sentences in Florence. And they said, any chance of his escaping? I said, did you see how John Gotti died of cancer? He has 23 hours a day in solitary, one hour of rec time alone. If any of his, like, remember seeing that video of John Gotti Jr. going to visit his dad and the dad had cancer and it's all being videotaped. There's no messages coming up. He has zero juice. So somebody asked me, what, is, what does he think of his son being arrested? I, said, I have no idea. I mean, I'm sure he's not pleased, but it doesn't affect him because he's not the power anymore. He's got nothing to, he's died. As they used to say, they're going to bury him under that prison. Well, that's the motherfucker's going to get, <laughs> and you know, people who think, oh, well, what, how could he not tunnel out? I said, if you think about the, sal just the economy of scale, if you think about the salary of a cop in Mexico or even a prison warden, well, maybe with tens of millions of dollars, you can do something. What would it take to bribe a high-ranking U.S.? It, it would take 
setting them up with billions of dollars on an island somewhere. Like you just couldn't find enough money. And you wouldn't have to just bribe one person. You'd have to bribe 10. 10, and you'd have to do it in a way that it didn't affect their families. Just, I mean, it is possible. Like Capone corrupted Chicago. It is possible to corrupt judges. But the money that would be required, and he's got not, they said $12 billion they wanted to seize from him. That isn't liquid. He doesn't have $12 billion in cash anywhere. Um, Anyway, but um, he's not the power. His sons are. Or his sons bring it back to today yeah. and, and set the scene for the listeners and viewers. It, I don't know if this is irony or not, but Ovidio is back in that same prison that El Chapo broke out of famously. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. In, in the city. Well, Alto Plano is the, is their super back is the highest uh, level they have. And now a judge ruled he will not be extradited. The thing that all narcos fear more than anything else, including going back to Escobar, is extradition to the U.S. I'm not saying the U.S. justice system is perfect, but they are afraid of it. They know they'll do serious time. Chapo knew when he was in a, in a Mexican prison, he's, he could essentially leave when he wanted to. He just would have to plan the escape and bribe the right people. But uh, yeah, they captured him and they put him in that same prison. This judge ruled he's not going to be extradited, but that could change. I, I think the reason there was this ruling because they want to calm those guys down in Sinaloa. It makes sense to kind of say, he's not being extradited. Well, what if there's a sudden, they moved Chapo, if you remember, in the middle of the night. It was kind of like a, oh, suddenly we're giving him to the U.S. And before anybody could do anything, he was on a helicopter. And there's a picture in the book. I don't know if you have all the, all the photos, but of him, uh, he's getting on the airplane, or sorry, the helicopter. And the look of fear, it's like, there's some amazing photos here. Yeah, that's Chapo as he's about to be uh, brought to the U.S. Oh, and yeah. He, they're shoving him. And the look in his eyes, I mean, you've never seen a photo of him. He's just, he's scared. He's like, fuck, I'm going away. I'm not, com-. he's probably already thinking, I'm never coming back to Mexico. This is goodbye to my country, right? So, uh, yeah, so Ovidio is there now. Um, backstory on him. So they caught him in 2019. Um, if you read Hunting El Chapo, he depended on several of the sons. Nobody's really sure why they call him Mouse. Ovidio is his name, Guzman Lopez. Uh, he's one of, uh, I think Griselda is his mother. Chapo had three wives and he never really divorced them. So it's kind of bigamy or, I don't know, what's multiple wives? I don't know. Yeah, big, so, yeah. but he had, <laughs> trigamy. I don't know when you have three wives, but um, he has the Groucho Marx line, uh, well, that's bigamy. <laughs> Groucho says, yes, it is. And it's big of me too. Um, <laughs> so Griselda has, two sons and Ovidio's 32. They call him mouse, I think, because he has black eyes and kind of big ears. I don't know. Or he's slippery. He's hard to catch. But they did catch him in 2019. It was a big, um, they had him in a safe house. And this is when all hell really broke loose because 700 gunmen strong came out with 50 cal that shot it out. And it was quite clear many people were going to keep dying so the president of mexico said mexico himself said set him free so they gave him back and now what changed this time they got him in a pre-dawn raid and they quickly got him to the airport i think that's why why would you shoot up an aero mexico flight if people have been on social media it's these terrified kids going why are they shooting at us they were trying they shot up a uh, mexican military plane i guess they were just trying to i think in in their minds of these young gunmen, if we can keep him here in Sinaloa, we can hide him. Once he's on that plane, once he's in Mexico City, we don't have control there. That's not their turf, and they don't have that juice to get him. And he doesn't, these younger guys, so they call them narco juniors, los menores, which means in Spanish, the the, the youngsters. Seriously, they, they don't have the savvy. They haven't bribed the right people. I mean, it's not a good look to have a massive military shootout well, with, I, I, was, I should interrupt, but something else that maybe you could address about the narco juniors um, is, which is interesting, the contrast with El Chapo's upbringing as literally a peasant, a guy who, you know, pulled himself up by the bootstraps to use that cliche, but he did. I, I'm not, I'm not, um, a, you know, defending how he made his money, but I'm just saying he, he really did. It was like, uh, you know, um, 
Horatio Elger, like, you know, Mexican yep. peasant version. And these guys that at least the sons and the ones that they're close with and some of Chapo's lieutenant sons, they grew up like, you know, in these wealthy neighborhoods and uh, they didn't really pay the same dues, if that makes sense. And I was wondering 100%. if you could com comment on that, how that affects their leadership or lack of leadership. Well, yeah, they were born into it. They're the second generation. All those original guys knew what it was to be hungry. They knew what it was to be do prison time. They knew what it was to be in the backseat of a car with a cop and they'll figure out how to bribe him. No, these kids were born wealthy. And literally, like Chapo would berate them for saying they had so many luxury car luxury cars, it was crazy. When they did the raid to capture El Chapo, I mean the sons were smart enough to drive to them because they had so many Mercedes. Like I think it was. It was tens of millions of dollars in cars, but they drove to the really nice Mercedes dealership in Culiacan and they parked all their cars there as if they were brand new and tried to leave them there. But they did the raid and they figured out the VIN numbers and stuff. And they, they, they made a massive seizure of like some of the nicest cars I've ever seen. But that pissed Chapo off because he was like, you don't need to be driving around in those cars. Um, it wasn't one of Chapo's sons. It was one of Chapo's nephews just a few months ago was in a club in Culiacan and ripped out his gun and blasted bullets in the ceiling. Wasn't arrested, wasn't touched. They are untouchable. I mean, they are untouchable in that state. So yeah, the, and then you factor in the social media, the testosterone, the juice, the, but you know, it's not the savvy and they never will. I think it's probably true for the American mafia as well, right? Like, I mean, the, the sons of the, it's nobody's ever as hungry as the immigrant generation. So that first generation of the cartel uh, bosses, yeah, their they're narco juniors are, they're known to be hotheads, they're known to be extravagant, they're known to be um, not politically connected the way the, the older generation was. So they didn't pay their dues, and then, and they, and they had it all handed hand to them, right? It's the difference between, uh, what was the line that Ann Richards said about George? Uh, you're born on third base and you thought you hit a triple? Yeah, right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that, that's what I mean. And and let me, I, I want to ask you also, just logistically, so so when El Chapo, the, his son, is arrested, in terms of the, the pushback by the, the narco juniors, is that something predetermined? Is that something that he that he tells his guys, if something goes down, you need to light these motherfuckers up and 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 destabilize the situation. In other words, who's calling the shots once he's arrested? Who who's making the decision? We're going to hold this town hostage uh, until this is is resolved. I mean, what's like the chain of command? I'm not I'm not sure he made the call, but he so he has a blood brother. Uh, so his his brother is Alfredo. There's Eva. I'm, I'm confused because there's four brothers. It's okay, um, but they're by different mothers. But he has a blood brother, and I'm pretty sure that he would have said, "Get my brother out." Or don't let him get to the fucking airport. And plus, there's all these guys who are um, lieutenants. Uh, a key a key role in the, in those cartels is actually a pilot. So because um, a lot of these guys drive, fly Cessnas. One of Chapo's key guys is a guy named Condor. Pilots, and they have they're almost like a lieutenant because they do the flights with the actual shit on there. But um, no, I think the underlings also know. Wait, our livelihood depends on this motherfucker. Like, oh yeah, good point. Here. Good point. You know, I mean, it's partly too. I mean, it's not just loyalty. It's and I, I mean, I literally when I saw like Scott made that point. Go look at the videos. This is not a random. This is stuff you've never seen in an American city. Like this is a war zone involving law enforcement and who has more firepower. And I almost like I said to myself, I think they just sit around playing too much at Xbox. <laughs> where, where you can actually do that shit. I mean, like Chapo, Caro, Quintero, they, yeah, they whacked, they whacked Kiki Camarena, but it was like a torture. And I mean, they do that. There's a very famous video of Chapo, by the way, with a machine gun, right? And he's got a guy who he thought betrayed him or ripped him off. It's a very famous video. You can find it on YouTube. The guy is tied to a pole and he's been tortured. And Chapo's walking around with a AK or whatever it might be, M16. And, and he says, saying, are you going to make me fucking kill you? He's looking for reasons not to kill the guy. Because he, he actually, blood is bad for business, as they say in The Godfather, right? And he's like, he's walking around saying, I don't want to fucking kill you. Like, I don't want to have to do this. Why are you making me do this? And then this, this generation, they're like, let's grab our fucking caliber machine gun and shoot it up. I, I almost think they sit around playing like Game of War or whatever the fucking uh, Xbox Call games are. And they think, Call of Duty, right. And they think that, you know, this, this is a shooter game. I'm going to fucking shoot it up with these guys. 
And because it worked in 2019, I mean, it's just, hey, man, the loss of values, the loss of values with the, I mean, going back to our pop culture references, does anybody think, you know, as much as Tony Soprano was like a suburban boss, you know, poor Anthony Jr., like oh, the yeah. softest can be, try to kill himself in the swimming pool. You know, you can't be born into that life and and under unless you're really psychopathic. Like, I mean, I think there are some kids who grew who grew up in that world and they kind of say, I can do this because they like hurting people and they like that. But but if you're just doing it like Chapo was to make money, no, they had it hand with them. They could have gone to school in Switzerland or you know, they could have done the all the they had all the cars and but um, anyway, yeah, they took over. So the Chapitos took over this wing, which was Chapo's personal drug trafficking organization. And uh, it seems like they mismanaged it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to get in. The, uh, the power has shifted to Guadalajara to a guy named Mencho. But yeah, these these narco juniors are. I remember when El Chapo was missing uh, in uh, after leaving Aldo Plano. Ovidio, I think it was Ovidio. He was on Instagram posting shit. And it was like, with my dad. I'm like, who the fuck is a top-level gangster that has a social media presence? You can't do that, guys. I tell this to young kids, by the way. I said, law enforcement tell, tell me, like guys I know that are feds. And like, oh, we just love social media. Like, fuck, we just love oh, yeah. Laundry. Yeah, the, the, uh, the uh, hip-hop songs, a lot of the songs that are on social media, I we know that prosecutors and and police are taking notes and they're using them in indictments. I mean, we know of cases of, of where, where they're talking about incriminating behavior on the you know, murders, selling drugs, uh, you yeah, know, I mean, guns, yes. weapons. Let this, let this be a message to all the young narco juniors out there, but actually to everybody. Like when I got divorced in New York, uh, even if your ex-wife or you soon to be ex-wife, delete something from Facebook or whatever. I remember my, uh, my divorce lawyer saying, I always tell my clients, never put something on Facebook that you don't want showing up in court. Because you could always get a delete and, you know, print it out and say, look what this social media is not a good look for somebody engaged in outlaw behavior. You're supposed to be John Dillinger. You're supposed to be running from the law. But yeah, it's a very interesting thing that you guys get into quite a bit. But I I think we talked about it a bit about Boris. The problem is the kind of guys who don't have that impulse control and they want instant gratification. They also have this narcissism. So you got these young guys. Yes, they could just be living with their tens of millions, but they want to floss it. They want to have that McLaren that nobody else has. They want to shoot off their gun in her. I mean, maybe it's to impress girls. I'm not quite sure, but. I'm going to digress for a quick second, but. Please it, do. It, and just throw this out there and piggyback off what Jimmy said and then tie it into what you said. In in Michigan right now, in Detroit, uh, you have a federal prosecutor that is uh prosecuting the they're called the seven mile bloods the smb yep and for the first time in 25 years the u.s attorney in michigan is seeking the death penalty um and it's for this smb case what's interesting twofold here one is that the case was built on social media all yeah. these murders that were charged um were either you know part of parts of the indictment are either posts that were made on social media of hit lists and threats or rap lyrics that were dropped on uh sound uh, soundcloud or yeah. youtube uh in some cases freely admitting their roles in these murders but what's interesting to me and i want to get jimmy's take on this too is that when it came to this particular case study, these guys really weren't doing it to to flaunt material wealth. They were doing it to brag that they had this five miles, you know, uh, square of of northeast Detroit. Um, I guess I, I have a hard time kind of reconciling that. Well, you know, what's the point of doing? I mean, and and it and it flies in the face of the Detroit drug kind of entrepreneurial spirit that's been a through line mostly of of this Detroit's drug world uh, dating back decades, where it was a 
it was an entrepreneurial endeavor. These guys were doing it so they could get a lot of money, move out of the city and flaunt their wealth. This seems almost like a regression, but it plays on yeah. the social media thing. Uh, do you have any take on that? So, yeah, I, I think it's interesting, as you point out, Scott, because it's not like they're repping an, an empire. It's it's just more about like their neighborhood. And and I agree with you. It's not extravagant. It's not like the 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 uh, black kingpins in the 80s and 90s that would rock fur coats and you know drive a Mercedes. These guys are real street guys. I mean, they're the, the, the bloods. I mean, they you know, it's it's pretty, pretty hood. And um, so it's you different. Never but, had bloods before. Yeah, right. No, that's right. It's the first time we've had like an institutionalized gang in Detroit. Detroit was always known as like, you know, um, it, was, it was more diffuse. You didn't you didn't have it was like neighborhood by or block by block. But yeah, it's different. But but I think the, the connective tissue is is regardless of what what their motivation is or what 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 they have access to in ter terms of material wealth and status, they want people to know that they're gangsters. And I think that's the connective tissue with the cartel guys is it's important to them. There's currency. There's a social currency through social media that I want you to know that I'm a bad motherfucker. <laughs> And, and I'm a gangster. And and it's it's uh that's not the way that like you it's the exact opposite of you referenced Doug uh, Carlo Gambino and some of the old some of the old narcos too. Like it's it's very different uh than, than that, which was uh stay lay pro uh be low profile so that you you the, the whole point is to not go to prison, yeah. not to get the attention. Well, you can't you can't you you can't replicate or educate hunger, you know, you can't replicate poverty. That that drive that the first generation of gangsters and all are you know Jewish. We talked about the Purple Gang. Your your mishpocha. Uh, very rarely do we have second, third generations of Jewish gangsters. Italian Italians uh, make their sons sometimes like Michael Francesi, but even then, Michael Francesi compared to Sonny is like the yuppie don, right? It's there's a change in the guard and the change in. Um, I just want to not to try to sell the book, but there's a lot. No, please, First of all, please try to sell your book. Go buy, <laughs> go buy Doug's book. It is <laughs> epic, 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 I want, epic literature. Uh, epic I just, I book. just want to say one thing. Just insider shit. If you guys want to know this, very few people in law enforcement or in the cartel would use like L. So Chapo just means shorty. So it doesn't really make sense the shorty, but that became the media thing, and they made us, you know, L Chapo is catchier. But so Raton, they sometimes have been saying El Raton, the mouse. It's just really Raton. And in these line sheets, these are intercepts. It's like Raton is requesting 20 rolls. That's $200,000 for logistics and moving 20 tons of mar marijuana via tractor trailer towards the U.S. border. Chapo tells him to tell Picudo, who's one of his uh, secretaries, to deliver it. Chapo reminds Raton they shouldn't be having their barbecues outside of Culiacan because there's been a lot of military and police activity. All through these line sheets, which are direct intercepts, you hear how much Chapo depended on his son's. Uh, they were basically his most trusted lieutenants, because I think in that cartel world, blood is really, they often will cement relationships between factions, marry my niece, marry, you know, I mean, it's, that's kind of Sicilian too, I suppose. But La No, Barbie, it's 100%. Uh, La Barbie yeah. too, right? La Barbie was able to get, uh, you know, merit in that world and and uh, his bona fides by marrying the, the daughter of, of one of the kingpins yep. he was working for. And just so you understand, so Chapo has, it's a funny line, like, who knows how many kids? It's like, Will Chamberlain said he had sex with 10,000 women. There's a line, so the guy, his name, really, the Homeland Security agent, uh, he did not want, he's still with the agency. We call him Brady. His name is John. But uh, he says to Drew at one point, he goes, um, how many kids does Chapo have? Nobody knows. I mean, you might be living next door to one of them. Like, we don't know. Like, he had so many kids. But of the sons, and there was one named Edgar, Edgar. And he was murdered in Culiacan in 2009. It might have been friendly fire, but he was killed in front of like a mall. And there's a shrine to him there. And uh, somebody said on his, I think it was around Christmas, it was just covered in flowers again. So he was the heir apparent and he was killed. He was being groomed by Chapo to be the next Chapo. And I think he was probably the most savvy. So it's almost like Sonny getting killed on the Cosmo. <laughs> like <Yeah. laughs> the boss gets killed. And then you got these other guys that really weren't supposed to be the bosses. And they're not. I mean, I don't know how you get groomed in that world because it requires. I'll tell you one thing that really amazed me about Chapo because Los Zetas, the former special forces, they were really brother. I mean, they would behead all these people. And 
They love to just terrorize. And I was asking Drew, I said, so if, so Chapo just, if you rip Chapo off, you kill, he killed you, right? You know, he, he, we found it really interesting. He said, there were a couple of times we would read about, and these are through their messaging devices, something went missing. Like this happens a lot in drug trafficking. Things get captured, uh, things get lost. So let's say you lost, you know, millions of dollars on a shipment. They would bring the guy to Culiacan, he would land, they'd blindfold him and drive him around in circles. And then he'd have a meeting in a safe house with Chapo. And I said, and then he killed him, right? <laughs> he said, no, a couple of times, it was really amazing. Apparently the guy would be able to explain it and then he'd leave. And I was like, so you get driven around in circles and you get taken to Chapo and, and you walk up. If, I mean, you don't kill all your underlings and you don't kill everybody if there's, I don't really know how to explain this, but I assume in drug trafficking, yeah, things go wrong. It's not always a ripoff. So it's not like the movies where you think, fuck, man, you lost Chapo a million dollars. Boom, bullet in the back of your head. You could talk your way. He did not, as much as he's he's credited with a thousand murders. That's not nothing, right? But apparently he didn't like bloodshed as much as some of these people. He really wanted to let you live if he could, because I mean, it's as simple as like Ice T said to me when we did this book with with Spike, you know, Ice never wanted to bring guns on these licks to take down jewelry stores because Doug, I mean, you know, you rob a jewelry store of 300,000, they, they're insured, but you take a life, they're never going to stop looking for you. So it might be that same mentality. It's like, man, this, if I don't have to kill you, don't make me kill you. Because then that's, for, I, I mean, not that it's going to be a cold case in Mexico, but it's going to create a blood feud with another clan. And, you know, it's not going to end well. So what we've seen in the last few days with Ovidio, it's dumb move. I mean, smart move would have been get captured, Go in, pay up hundreds of millions of dollars if you have it to the right people. Escape in a laundry truck as Chapo did in the first escape. I mean, there were smarter ways to do this, but no, his guys just came out there with. Yeah, my my hey. understanding is that is that um, uh, that not to you know underappreciate how violent El Chapo and his organization could be, but when they started getting crazy violent was because the Zetas are the ones who escalate. They're the ones who started yeah. that escalation. When they started decapitating people and hanging people from the overpass, that forced the rival cartels like Sinaloa, they had to up their game. They they yeah. had to start. And so then, then um, El Chapo's organization, then they started hiring ex-cops, ex-military, because it really was turning into now this paramilitary groups war with yep. each other and these guys we talked about this with agent uh silva on our show leo silva a dea agent he investigated uh the uh zetas and the uh beltran leva cartel and um you know these guys were trained in counterinsurgency techniques some of them some of them trained in the united states which is yep. really fucked up and not cool uh they they were trained in counterinsurgency techniques which is to your point of terrorize the population it's yep. not just gangland warfare of we got to take out some of their guys so that we can gain territory. It's about uh, terrorizing the population so that there's basically paralysis, social paralysis, and and then and then th then they can do whatever they want. So once they started doing that, I, I'm not not trying to sound like El Chapo was this peace loving guy, but but they really had no choice, I think, but to also start to employ those kinds of tactics yeah. is, that, is that your understanding too that's that's true with los Zetas and but there was also a very bloody war with the tijuana they're all cousins, oh yeah but yeah. with the tijuana uh, the ariel felix uh, clan and the afo so, yeah yeah i mean it's it's all about what they call plazas plazas mean routes to get to the u.s border and there's several key ones but so controlling a plaza is really a, a key thing but yeah sinaloa was again like the genovese family if they were the ivy league they were the Sinaloa cartel, which means Chapo and Mayo. They were known for having the government in their pocket, you know, paying off the right guys. Um, when Drew and uh, and his partner are doing, they're ready to kind of go trust the the admiral from from the Mexican Marines. They see this intercept from a guy named, and now he's flipped. It's a guy named Damaso Lopez. Damaso was the prison warden who allowed Chapo to escape. He's an educated man. I don't think he's a lawyer, but they would call him leak, which means licensed one. And um, he was making sure, I think Chapo said, make sure the guy in the city, Mexico City, is getting 100, 100 to 1,000 monthly. We don't know if that was a politician, a general, but yeah, they were just greasing the right people. So Sinaloa, 
was that gold standard of saying, we don't need to shoot it out with you because we got the government. We, we have the people who are really in control of this country with us, like they're then on, on our payroll. But yeah, I mean, shootouts with anybody is, uh, can't imagine. I mean, what Chapa wanted was a steady stream of income. Like he really was, he, he was savvy enough. Just uh, one little thing, if we get into the, the economics of it. He actually didn't, so he had a, a, a Colombian name, Alex Cifuentes. His stuff was Colombian, but he actually got it in Ecuador. So he would, his price point, when he would get it for 4,000, three to 4,000 a key. On the streets of Los Angeles, of course, Mexicans don't retail. They just wholesale it. So 3,000 to 4,000 a key, he would then sell it in LA or Phoenix for 25,000 a key. But then when he found out in Vancouver, it was going for 35,000. He said, exploit Canada. That RCMP up there is weak. They, like all Canada has is one national... <laughs> We have the RCMP and they have to like cover the highways and they don't, we don't have the alphabet suit. The U S really has dedicated agencies, DEA, ATF co covers the bikers. And so he saw the weaknesses in the federal system in Canada, but he also understood it's not that much farther from LA to Vancouver. So, you know, in the book, we've got these amazing pic pictures of plastic bananas, like just hordes and hordes of these plastic bananas and people would stuff like workers would stuff like a half a key into a plastic banana. Very ingenious because then they would have green bananas in a real container ship with actual bananas. And there is a rule, I think, with custom seizures when it's produce. It's not like in the French Connection where, you know, they got that car and they can just take apart that car. With produce, I think there's like a 48-hour period because, you know, you can't falsely accuse someone. So you've got like plastic bananas in a container on a container ship with real bananas in the port of Vancouver. Good luck finding which bananas have the cocaine in them. I mean, dogs can't smell it. So he exploited Vancouver and Canada, partly because he was like, 10,000 more a kilo? Come on. Uh, business savvy. Definitely had some business savvy. Yeah, and, and he, and he wanted st stability, I think, with like political stability. Um, I, I used the term uh, last week, Scott. I think I, I was talking about the cartels, and I, I think I, I used the term state capture. And I, I wish I wouldn't have said that because I, I don't think that's what it is. I don't I don't think the, the cartels want to run the state. They just want the state to step to get out of the way and not yep. and not stop them from from transporting narcotics. It's not like a uh, a thing like ISIS where they where they literally yep. want to capture the state and be the government or the Taliban. They're, I don't yep. think they're interested in governing. They just want they just want the government to they not want the government to leave them alone. Yeah. to leave them alone. Right. Yeah. Yep. They want the government to be their kind of active uh, behind the scenes partners in allowing the flow of drugs, which let's be honest, it's the demand for illicit, you know, painkillers and, and stimulants and all that. It's the huge demand in the United States and Canada, people getting coked up and taking fentanyl. I mean, so I was telling somebody on a Canadian show, I was like, this isn't like some new iPhone that they're forcing on the consumer. <laughs> There's a huge demand. And when you take out Ovidio Guzman Lopez, it's like a, a whack-a-mole. I mean, another guy's popping up. That demand is not going. So the addict, when you point your finger at Mexico and say, look, these drug traffickers, it's like, well, no, they're supplying what people in the United States seem to want badly, which is painkillers, stimulants, whatever. It might've gotten worse during COVID. I don't know, but it's like the two things have to be addressed, addiction, crisis in the United States, as well as the production of drugs in Mexico and how it gets here. But yeah, if there wasn't a I demand, agree. there wasn't a demand in the United States and Canada, these guys would not be billionaires. We made them billionaires. No, I agree that the Uncle Sam, it seems to me, if I can editorialize for a moment, has always viewed this as a supply problem and and hardly ever considers it a demand problem. And I, and I, I mean, look at the markets, right? It, it's Canada, the US, Western Europe, uh, so, um, especially the United States, but unless you uh, address that, there's always going to be someone who's going to supply that market. And I think that's with any vice, right? Yeah. Not just not just narcotics. It was with booze during prohibition. Someone's going to step up if there's a demand. So, I mean, what what do you foresee? Like, um, like if. if if the if the sons aren't able to hold on to control, I mean, who, who's the other guy? Is it Zambada? Is that the other guy? Miles that... Zambada has in Sinaloa, but uh, yeah, just Google um, your 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 listeners and all that. So the acronym in Mexican or Spanish, sorry, in Spanish is 
Nueva, uh, the Nueva Generación de Jalisco, the new generation of Jalisco, they are the power. They stepped in after Chapo's uh, extradition. I mean, there still is a Sinaloa group, but the more powerful people is this guy, Mencho, and I think he's, he's on the wanted list of the DEA, but, you know, um, he was the reason there was a bunch of killings in the Playa del Carmen um, recently, which has always been safe, the Mayan Riviera, uh, because, you know, they're trying to expand into other people's territory. You know, there's always going to be, there's going to be somebody. So, uh, Miles Zambada, I think he's still powerful, but he's an elderly guy. I think he's even, so Chapo was born in 57, Miles Zambada must be 70. Um, you know, the older generation, I guess they, it's what they grew up doing. I always wondered when, why did Chapo just not stop when he had billions? And he said, it's just what he did. He, he loved doing it. I guess that's yeah. what gangsters do too. It's, that, it's like I a Walter White in Breaking Bad. Like he's like, I'm really yeah. good at this. I'm really, I've made enough money, but I'm really good at this. And I kind of like it. And so, yeah, like, I remember when Breaking Bad was on, my buddy who turned me onto it, he said, I had to stop watching it after a while. And I was like, no, I, I get it. Like he's, he's beating cancer. And I said, oh, you haven't got to where he's in remission. I was like, what do you mean? But then he just starts liking being this guy. And right. I'm like, oh, no, I just thought he was doing it because he was a sports school teacher. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Yeah, eventually. Yeah. And, and I, th I think you're right. I mean, I, I don't think it, these guys, they don't. It's just in their it's in their, um, you know, their their makeup. But um, this I, I know we're, we're, we're running out of time here, but, um, you know, we're all interested in, in these international connections and, and also the Mexican cartels. We, we've talked about the U.S. and Canada. But they also have connections with the Sicilians, the Calabrians, the Russians. I mean, that's that's oh, how yeah. the cocaine is getting to to Western Europe. So sure. I was just wondering if you if you wanted to talk about that just for for a moment, like the other well, international connections. The globalization, you know, there's a big story out of the UK, and an Irish woman had me on. It's the Kinahan cartel. The cartel. Yeah, yeah. Those yep. guys? And I was reading about it. So it's Daniel Kinahan. I mean, they're tied to Tyson Fury, but you know what? It's just a transnational. Well, who are they dealing with? They're dealing with South Americans to get the product. They're dealing with Moroccans to transport the product into Spain. They're dealing with Spain because Ireland does not have a border. And they were talking about it being globalization of, you know, the super cartel. And I said, it's not a super cartel. This is what the Mexicans, like Chapo has been, I mean, he was exploring uh, Australia as a place. Um, my understanding is the Colombians were making more money sending it directly via Nigeria into Europe. There's so much money for the Mexicans to make in North America that I don't think they have to supply. It's, it's I always look at these things as geography. Just look at the U.S. border with Mexico. Yeah, of course. How, yeah. many, how many places you could have tunnels? And then look at when, when, they, when I realized that a lot of these were these little fishing boats coming up the coast towards Seattle or L.A. or wherever. I mean, it's just ingenious, right? You've got little fishing boats. There must be so many of them. And they're dragging a little, whatever you call it, a buoy. Or there, there's a load there. And it's got GPS. Oh, the Coast Guard comes. It's, how are you going to stop that? It's so yeah. simple. I mean, there are legit I, I fishing boats. It's very, very hard to... to um, but yeah, the globalization, the partnership with, I mean, drug addiction and partying, I'm just amazed. Like I was writing this book, El Hunting El Chapo, sitting in a pub in my local pub in Calgary, Alberta, Canada, right? So I'm just sitting there and I'm still researching it and writing with my laptop. You know, I don't know, James Joyce got to me as a kid, like he loved to write, you know, write in pubs and stuff. I'm not Irish. Scott and I are Jewish. We should be writing in delis, right? Like having a corn beef sandwich. <laughs> corn beef sandwich. <laughs> but I'm saying, but I'm saying, I should be, I should be at like Ben's Delicatessen on 37th Street in New York, which I do like to go to and get the kasha barnacles. They're great, but it's still fun to have a beer. I'm sitting there and I'm typing away. And this guy said, What are you writing about? I said, I'm writing about a, you know, a Chapo. And did you know that all the all of the cocaine in Canada comes from El Chapo? He had a lock, it was coming in through Vancouver. Of course, he's not retailing it. He gets it to Iranian gangsters and the bikers, the Hells Angels. They get it across Canada. The guy says, that's real cool. And he's just the guy at the bar. And then he goes, by the way, you need some? I said, what? <laughs> I said, I said, I'm writing about this and you're trying to sell me shit. Okay, no. Um, and you know what? Like, a friend of mine the other day, I said, how was your New Year's? He goes, I stopped drinking. I said, on New Year's? He goes, no, I did a three-day coke bender on new year's and then i mean i just can't go go on living like this and i was like i mean we're surrounded by people you know wall street and lawyers so i mean th my problem with the drug thing is that so many people kind of look at it like oh it's these degenerates they're in the hood they're i mean fucking wall street's filled with guys using coke 
I mean, when I, I was fascinated with a video, like what I don't know that much about fentanyl. I've never seen it. I've never, but I just started to look at the, all these ODs. Like, and I was like, that's what Tom Petty died of? Oh, Prince had bad knees and he was, you know, with oxycodone. Fentanyl is just this, it's our overdose crisis. So there's a pain crisis in America, right? And I remember, well, I think it was 60 Minutes or something said, why are all these kids turning to like hillbilly heroin and all? Well, because their parents have prescriptions and they steal a couple pills and they like that feeling of codeine. Well, then they can't keep stealing mom's legit prescription. So they go and find a guy that's going to sell them the shit. It's coming from Mexico. So- we're all using it. I mean, sorry, not personally. A lot of people are using it. A lot of people are profiting from it. You know, you know, I, you, I me think... you mentioned something about sorry to interrupt, but you, you mentioned something interesting about Sinaloa not having to sell to Europe. And that 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 makes sense to me because the last reports I saw, the Sicilians and the Calabrians had connections with the Zetas. Now that was a while ago because the Zetas are, have now kind of mutated into something else because they were right. sort of on the decline. But but then that, that sort of makes sense to me that that the Italians connections would be with one of the other organizations because well, they, be, doesn't have, they don't have to where the Zetas might have wanted customers. Right. But, but also just look at the geography. So yeah. you would want to be on the Caribbean coast. You'd want to be, okay, there, you just got that ocean. Sinaloa is a whole, what are you going to go through the Panama canal? Or yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Great point. Yeah. Right. yeah. I mean, I, that's interesting. The geography is interesting there. Yeah. Well, yeah. Just look at the map of Mexico. It's a huge country, but Sinaloa's power is that it's really just below, it's right below California. I mean, so you've got, you can tunnel up right through the, the Tijuana connection, or you can just go up with container ships. Um, yeah, I think so. The west coast of Mexico, but I think and what exists of the of the Colombians are, yeah. From what I understand, you get it through Nigeria, you get it through Spain. Spain is a big, uh, yeah. You know, they have that little tiny, tiny strait between Gibraltar, between uh, you know, Morocco. I mean, that seems to be where it gets in. But you know, as long as there are drugs uh, out there for your supply. But I also love this idea that you know. Narcos, like I'm, I want, I think I'm going to have a podcast with a Mexican journal, for, journalist friend of mine. He goes, "We got to get a, away from this this narrative of the cartel. Like, why is it a cartel if it's Mexicans and it's just drug trafficking? If it's like Lucky Ch Luciano was involved in heroin trafficking, wasn't he? You know, I mean, a lot of Italian Americans were involved with drugs, but it's it's a kind of stigma. So when they're Latin Americans, they're a, they're a cartel or they're narcos." But if you're a Russian gangster and you're importing heroin, you're a gangster. <laughs> yeah, it's sort of like a it's a weird narrative that we have. That so the real reporting that I know from guys risking their lives. And by the way, reporting on the stuff in Mexico is costing many journalists their lives. It's very very dangerous. Yeah, you know, shout out crazy. to our friend Yoan Grillo, who yeah, I think yeah. Doug, you know, you know too. I, uh, I know his work. I mean, I read El Narco. Yeah, he's good. I mean, dude. and and he's a British guy that went there and just immersed right um but yeah there's numbers and numbers of guys who are displaced i have a friend who's been displaced to canada just to write about the cartels because it's he is a political refugee he can't write about it safely in his own country and he comes from a journalistic family so yeah i mean when i talk to him about it he goes they're doug they're organized crime groups don't call you know calling it a cartel that's part of the american media narrative that we kind of it is a cartel in terms of yes you don't if you don't undersell your your fellow guys in that region's price point then i guess it is a cartel but you know they're not hierarchical they are they're just mafia guys they're they're also mafia the same way that i mean the globalization of it all i see parallels between all these organized crime groups there's very similar people. <laughs> and the idea that the American mafia didn't traffic in drugs, I think the rule was just don't get caught, right? Like <laughs> you were talking yeah. about, I mean, Scott, you were you're really talking about the Sicilian connections in the, the Cherry Hill uh, Gambinos. I mean, and these guys were like major, major, major. Oh, 100%. The French connection. The American connection. was built on the shoulders of narco, narcotics trafficking. There's, there's no way to sugarcoat that. So the I know if you really watch ever, uh, ban against it is when Anello Della Croce was like, I we won't turn over the tapes to Paul. I mean, it was like, oh, you got caught with the drugs. And you're like, so that was the kind of weird thing with the American mafia. It's like everybody knew and you could kick up to the boss from your drug profits. Just don't get busted with it because yeah. you're going to well, get 100 years and, and you're going to flip. 
I think that's right. all they were really afraid of is oh, the yeah. kind of time you got with heroin trafficking made you become a an, an informant or a, a state's witness. And, and it was but, a bad it was a bad look for people that were trying to portray themselves as these uh, Robin Hoods looking out for the community if they were yeah. also billed as the people that were flooding that same community with with powder and profiting from yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, uh, exactly. And exactly. then look at you know the two the two founders of the american mafia lucky luciano and meyer lansky you know huge parts of their uh accumu accumulated gangster wealth came from narcotics trafficking lucky luciano was a infamous heroin yeah trafficker. Yeah. yeah but so it's funny when I, I people tell me oh yeah i saw the godfather where they say you know we, we were against it and i said yeah but do you remember the pizza connection that was a huge case all these pizzerias in Brooklyn, and before that, the French Connection. It was coming from Corsicans, but you know. And how about like, the fact that the Godfather is fiction? It's it's Mario Puzo's, well, and, and, and also, and also, like, how about the fact that in the Godfather they say, "Yes, we are going to sell drugs." <laughs> the yeah, people make in the dark to the darker people because yeah, they've right, lost their souls anyway, right? Right. right. Yeah. So they they overlook the part that it's only Marlon Brando who doesn't want to sell drugs. Literally, everyone else does in the movie, including Sonny, including Tom Hagen, and yeah. the other bosses. A lot and of money. Agree. A lot of money in that white powder. A lot. Of, I don't right. know. If pops. A lot of money in that white powder. <laughs> so they they all, they actually agree. They have the meeting where even Vito signs off on it. So it's funny, Scott and I talk about the Godfather myth. But it's funny because it's actually um, a myth of something that's not even in the film. Because in the film, yeah. they actually all want to sell drugs except Vito, and they agree to do it. <laughs> so I'm not sure where how that myth was. And you know, it's you know, funny spread. because Barney Ross, you know, I wrote that book about Barney Ross. And he came back from Guadalcanal, uh, a morphine addict, and then the doctor stopped giving him morphine. So he starts scoring, scoring heroin. And when he finally came out of his addiction, he started to say, look, I don't think we should be prosecuting heroin addicts because at that time you, you say, but going after these racketeers that are bringing it in. Well, he was talking about the Jewish mafia and the, Amer and the Italian mafia. I'm pretty sure they were the people bringing it in. I'm talking about in 46, 47. Oh, hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, for sure. you know, when, when we look at these guys, uh, Ovidio, getting back to our point, you know, I mean, it's all part and parcel of the same problem, which is uh, uh, people want illicit substances uh somebody's gonna supply it and that oldest drug dealer rationalization in the world well if i don't bring it in somebody else's my kids gotta eat too you know every drug dealer i've ever met when i ask him you didn't feel bad selling crack like that no somebody else was gonna sell it if i didn't yeah okay so yeah and these they guys rationalize uh, it but I, I suspect what's going to, if you want my prediction, Ovidio is going to get extradited to the United States. He'll be the po poster boy for fentanyl. And the the flow of narcotics will not change in one bit. The exact amounts will come in. Somebody else will step into his place. I used to think it was a Pez dispenser, right? But nobody knows what a Pez dispenser is. So I always tell people like, yeah, if you go to like Chuck E. Cheese with a whack-a-mole game, I said, yeah, a cops and a DEA, they'll always say, it's whack-a-mole, Doug. I mean, we'll catch this guy, boom. You know, yeah. El, Chapo, El, El Chapo's arrest did not change anything. And his kids can't run the business the way he did. So, yeah, look up El Mencho out of Guadalajara. And he's really the power. And he's about 45 years old. Uh, uh, Nasario, I can't remember his real name, but. Yeah, I think he, he just arrested his kid, El Menchito. Oh, really? Okay, maybe. But yeah, point, people ask me, like, oh, I, but I'm amazed at the amount of people telling me, oh, I just love that El Chapo shit. I said, what do you mean? I just love hearing about it. And I'm like why the guy was a degenerate you know serial rapist of of uh underage girls not a nice man what is it that you love about it i don't know the money the power well i mean fat... careful doug because we want people to listen to our podcast <laughs> so no, the but I mean, people this... that want to hear about el chapo is good for <laughs> i know i i get it i get I'm, it i'm get just it. But, i'm just teasing i'm just teasing but it's fascinating <laughs> to me because it is uh it, it is just so widespread how much people are interested in this stuff well, you can you can be fascinated by it and not um, not uh, condone uh, because uh, we we were talking about in my uh, crime and film class today how like you know we look at the analytics for our podcast and it, it's a um, like ninety five percent male audience but but if you look at podcast in general it's like it's like a lot of it's a large female audience but the female audience they love the serial killer 
podcast. Yeah. Like that, like yeah. they're not into the gangster stuff. It's a and serial the wife killer stuff. Wife kills husband. husband yeah, yeah, right. Wife. Like the murder yeah. tainment yeah. kind of stuff. And it's not like they think that they're good guys, serial killers. It's not like yeah. they approve of it, obviously, but they find it fascinating. And I, I think there's a similar thing that goes up. Now, now I agree with you. If there's some a person who thinks that like they idolize El Chapo or Capone or any of these guys, yeah, that that's some pathological shit. But but just finding it fascinating, you know, we we all do, and it's important. So you know, I was just teasing you a little bit. No, but, no, yeah, I know you mean. Original ga- Gangsters is a great title for a podcast, and it really is. <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm obsessed with them. I'm obsessed with every ethnic group's, crime, you know, the Irish, the, the Jews. It, it's just these guys that were willing to say, "I'm just going to do it outside the law. I don't. I will not follow the rules of society. I'm going to make it my way." And then I'm going to make my kids set up so they like my last. Oops, my last. He sends his son to West Point, right? So it's like I'm going to do it, but it's going to be my stepping stone because I was an immigrant. And that that is, I mean, you know, whether it's admirable or not, it's fascinating. And we're, yeah, I, we're I think so. unlimited appetite for these kinds of stories. No, I think so. Did you want to add anything else, Bernie, before we uh, wrap up? Wow. Okay, That's awesome. I love yeah. This yeah, thanks again, Doug, and and please. Uh, um, Sorry we went so long. We always do. I mean, no, it's it's, it's quite all right. It, it's so uh, it, it's always fun chatting with you. Hunting El Chapo, also the last boss of Brighton, and Doug's uh, published a number of other books about Italian mafia, and we still haven't talked to him about the the book with Ice T. That that'll be next. Hopefully, you'll return again I'll... soon, and we'll talk about that. Well, let's give it a give it a little time for this one to sink in. And yeah, sure, let's. I love the podcast, though. I mean, I was transfixed to the uh, Sicilian Gambino connection. Oh, that I appreciate family of, that. Of, of all of the all the families, seems to have the, the, they 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 uh, reinvigorated their ranks with the Sicilian connections, right? Yeah, and yeah. It themselves. seems like yeah, yeah. We appreciate that. So, uh, anyhow, I wanted to remind everyone: please uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Please subscribe to the podcast. Follow us on social media: Facebook, Twitter um instagram maybe well, we have a twitter or a tiktok account we're not very active but but maybe we should because uh you know our demographics people under TikTok. 25 are, <laughs> that, that's how they find sure. out about podcasts is tiktok so we're gonna um see if we can get ben a social media intern or something like that but <laughs> if we are on facebook instagram twitter youtube please follow us uh douglas century uh you have a website right where you can find out more about your books uh just go to Douglas Century, all one word, douglascentury.com, and yeah, link to my books or just Google. It's an odd enough name that uh, nothing much comes up except me uh, writing about Vladimir Putin being a gangster or whatever. I've got a bunch of stuff out there recently. Um, but I love the show. I mean, this is this is just my wheelhouse. Whatever you guys talk about, I'm fascinated. So yeah. I really appreciate you guys having me on. And anybody want to know more about Narcos, feel free. On my website, there's, uh, there's email. You can email me and ask me questions. <laughs> right on, Doug. Thanks again. Uh, Jimmy Bucciolato, Scott Bernstein, we're out. See you next week.